Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on an ASMR audio adventure into the interior of one of Britain's grandest stately homes, Chatsworth House. This subject was suggested to me by one of my subscribers, Savannah Portenier, and it's a topic I'm very happy to talk about as Chatsworth is an absolutely stunning place and it's somewhere that I've enjoyed visiting on several occasions. The house itself is extremely large and there's a lot to see. So, depending on how we get on, I think I'll probably do this tour in two parts so that we can take our time visiting every room. As we explore the house together, I'll point out some of the key features that are on display to visitors, and we'll also discover a little bit about the history of the building and some of its former occupants, including the rather shrewd Elizabethan Chatelaine Bess of Hardwick, the writer, activist and socialite Georgina Duchess of Devonshire, and William George Spencer Cavendish, the sixth Duke of Devonshire, who was known as the Bachelor Duke, and who was a very enthusiastic collector. As usual, there'll be a slideshow of images to accompany our tour, and my thanks for these goes to the photographer Simon Wilkinson, who's very kindly allowed me to use his photographs of Chatsworth too illustrate this tour. You can find more of Simon's work on Flickr, and I'll also put a link to his online portfolio in the description below the video. His photographs are very beautiful indeed, so I would recommend that you look at them at some point, but of course you don't need to look at them right now if you don't want to. If you prefer you can just close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you. So, welcome to Chatsworth. The house stands in the beautiful landscape of the Derbyshire Dales in central England, and it's been the family seat of the Cavendish dynasty since the mid-16th century. Like a lot of great country houses, the building that stands here today is the culmination of successive generations, each of whom have put their own stamp on the house, and uh, on occasions have remodelled it to suit their personal tastes. However, the oldest part of the estate dates from the 1550s, and it was built under the auspices of Elizabeth Cavendish who is known today as Bess of Hardwick. Bess didn't begin life as a noblewoman. She was actually the daughter of a Derbyshire farmer, but through a series of four increasingly successful marriages, she managed to rise to the peak of Elizabethan society, and through her final marriage, finally became the Countess of Shrewsbury. However, it was her second marriage to Sir William Cavendish that allowed her to come here and build Chatsworth. Cavendish was originally from Suffolk, but his new wife persuaded him to sell off his southern properties and buy land in her home county of Derbyshire instead, which he did and so Bess was able to set about creating a new and beautiful house for herself. Her original building was then later remodelled in the 17th century by Bess's great-great-grandson, who was also called William Cavendish, and who was the first Duke of Devonshire, and the house was then added to again later on by various generations of the family, most notably perhaps by the sixth Duke of Devonshire, who lived here in the 19th century. So, the house that we're about to step into 
contains details from many different periods of history. But one of the loveliest things about Chatsworth is that all of those different styles and eras seem to blend together just beautifully into an elegant and gracious whole. Let's enter the house now by stepping in through the north entrance hall and walking along the north corridor into the painted hall. This is a statement room. It was deliberately designed to stagger guests when they first arrived at Chatsworth, and uh, it's full of the most magnificent swagger. The hall was built in the 1690s by the first Duke of Devonshire, and as the name suggests, both the walls and the ceiling are covered in paintings, murals by the French artist Louis Laguerre. They depict scenes from the life of Julius Caesar, and they're so large and monumental that they seem to engulf the visitor as soon as you enter the room with their enormous proportions and bright, swirling colours. This vibrancy is strikingly set off as well by an elegant black-and-white checkerboard floor, which creates a very striking contrast with the glowing colours in the rest of the room. And taken all together, the painted hall is a very exuberant display of grandeur that immediately impresses the eye and overwhelms the senses. However, once your eye grows used to the dazzling splendour around you, you start to notice some of the finer details in the room. And one of the things that's rather interesting is that the murals contain quite a few examples of trompe l'oeil, that is to say, paintings that deliberately deceive the eye by mimicking real life so closely that it creates an optical illusion. As we walk round Chatsworth, we'll find several of these trompe l'oeil illusions, and in the painted hall, one of the most captivating of them is a stone arch that features high up in the centre of the north wall. The arch is Romanesque in design, and it has two carved putti, or cherubs, sitting above it. And the whole thing is a mirror of an identical archway on the opposite side of the room by the great stairs. However, the archway by the stairs is real, while the arch on the north wall is simply a clever trompe l'oeil painting, which has been placed there both to trick the eye and also to give the room a graceful sense of symmetry. We'll find more of these charming optical illusions in other rooms as we walk around the house. But for now, let's continue our tour by passing through a door on one side of the great stairs and entering the grotto. Grottos are quite a common feature in large English country houses, but they're usually to be found outside, not inside. However, this room was installed by the first Duke of Devonshire when he remodelled the house as a testament to the modernity of his improvements because when he was refurbishing in the 1690s, he decided to install plumbing for a continuous hot and cold running water supply, and this made Chatsworth one of the very first houses to feature hot and cold running water, and the Duke was very proud of this fact. He had the grotto created, therefore, to show off his fashionable innovation. And the centrepiece of the room is a large fountain, which is decorated with a bas-relief of the Roman goddess Diana, as well as a couple of rather splendid Baroque-looking dolphins. And this was installed so that guests could admire and wonder at the amazing novelty of having running water within inside a house. Beyond the grotto, we can walk down the chapel corridor, which is a long passageway holding a series of ancient and classical sculptures that have been collected by the Cavendish family over the centuries. 
The most remarkable one we'll encounter is a giant carved stone foot, which is thought to have once been part of an 11 metre high statue of a Greek goddess, and which dates from around the 1st century BC. It's a left foot, and rather interestingly, there's a very similar looking right foot in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, and classical scholars are fairly certain that uh, it's the other foot from the original sculpture's pair. Perhaps one day they'll be reunited, although I can imagine that moving either one of them would be quite an undertaking because these are very large and heavy feet indeed. Off the chapel corridor, we can turn left into the oak room, and this is a dark and relatively low-ceilinged room, which is entirely covered in heavy oak panelling. The panelling was introduced to the house in 1837 by the 6th Duke of Devonshire, who was known as Hart to his friends and who was nicknamed the Bachelor Duke because, after being disappointed early in love, he chose never to marry. In his youth, Hart had fallen in love with his cousin, Lady Caroline Ponsonby, but she rejected his proposal of marriage in favour of another suitor, William Lamb, who would later go on to become the Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, and who was a trusted adviser to the young Queen Victoria. However, Lady Caroline perhaps made the wrong choice because seven years after her marriage to Lamb, she would go on to cause a scandal by having a very public affair with the poet Lord Byron. Meanwhile, the sixth Duke of Devonshire continued to remain single, perhaps because he was disillusioned with the marriage state or perhaps because he never quite got over Caroline. Either way, he still enjoyed the company of uh, a mistress, Eliza Warwick, with whom he had a ten-year secret affair, but he was never again tempted to propose marriage and remained single for the rest of his life. His passion and commitment were channeled into a different course as a result, and he became an enthusiastic collector of art and artefacts. As we walk round Chatsworth, we'll see many of the fabulous treasures he amassed during his lifetime. But here in the Oak Room, the panelling that lines the walls is perhaps a rare example of a time when the Duke allowed his passion for collecting to get the better of him. He bought it at an auction in London, which he visited with a friend, and uh, like many impulsive auction buys. He later came to regret his hasty enthusiasm, and uh, after the panelling had been installed at Chatsworth, he was said to have commented that so inconsiderate a purchase was never made. Nevertheless, the panelling, which was originally made for a German monastery, remains here in the Oak Room, and it depicts carved reliefs of various worthy-looking cardinals and bishops. The next room we'll visit continues the ecclesiastical theme because it's the family chapel, which was also built by the first duke and is still used today on rare occasions. The chapel has glowing cedarwood panelling and a central baroque altarpiece carved from alabaster, and these carvings were made by a local Derbyshire sculptor, Samuel Watson, who was also a very talented woodcarver, and whose work we'll see more of when we visit the state apartment. In the curved alcove of the altarpiece, there's a rather interesting statue. It's a gilded bronze sculpture of St. Bartholomew by the contemporary artist Damien Hurst, and this was purchased by the current Duke who is the 12th Duke of Devonshire, because, like many of his ancestors, he is also an enthusiastic collector of contemporary art. The chapel also features another dramatic ceiling painting by Louis Laguerre. 
this time showing Christ in glory. And again, if you look closely, you'll see that the artist has once more used a trompe l'oeil effect in order to make the oval frame of the mural appear as though it's carved from stone and wood. Once we've finished admiring the splendours of the chapel, we can return to the painted hall and begin our ascent up the great stairs. These will take us up to the second floor of the house, but when we reach the top of the first flight of stairs, we can stand in the archway and look back to admire the painted hall from a higher perspective. It certainly is a very majestic room, and if it looks vaguely familiar, it's probably because you've seen it on screen. The hall has featured in several films and TV series, including the 2005 film adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, and also the TV adaptation of Death Comes to Pemberley, which was written by the crime writer P.D. James as a sequel to Jane Austen's original novel. In both of these dramas, Chatsworth doubles as Pemberley, the beautiful family seat of Mr. Darcy, and it's possible that Austen herself was partly inspired by the house when she wrote her description of Pemberley, because she was known to have visited the area in 1811 while she was revising her manuscript of Pride and Prejudice. When we reach the top of the great stairs, we'll enter the state apartment, and this is a series of sumptuous interconnecting rooms, which the first duke had built in anticipation of a royal visit from King William III and Queen Mary II. Together they reigned over England in the latter part of the 17th century, and they were the ones who bestowed the dukedom upon the Cavendish family. Sadly for the duke, the royal couple never actually visited Chatsworth, but the rooms he built in their honour are certainly stately enough to warrant a visiting monarch. The first one we'll enter is the Great Chamber which was designed to be an audience chamber for the king and queen. Today, the room doesn't contain much furniture, but nevertheless there's plenty to see, because the ceiling features yet another enormous and very flamboyant painting. Not by Laguerre this time, but by the Italian master Antonio Verrio. The painting's called The Return of the Golden Age, and it uh, depicts a scene of various vices embodied in human form, being attacked and subdued by figures of the virtues. The subject was meant to be a flattering reference to the reign of William and Mary, but the painting also contains a more domestic and uh, local reference in the form of the figure of Atropus. Atropus was one of the three classical Greek fates, and she's frequently depicted in art and literature as carrying a pair of shears, which she uses to cut through the thread of human life. So she's quite a formidable and uh, perhaps scary figure, and her inclusion in Verio's ceiling painting is notable because the figure of Atropus that he's used is apparently a mythologised portrait of the first Duke of Devonshire's housekeeper, Mrs Hackett. According to anecdotal Chatsworth gossip, Verio included Mrs Hackett in his ceiling because the pair of them developed a feud, and so he took his revenge by immortalising her in paint as Atropus and she's depicted wearing a diaphanous and rather ghostly grey robe, with a crown and girdle of oak leaves, and of course she's carrying her shears, and is frozen in the act of appearing to cut through a golden thread, which presumably represents the life of some poor hapless mortal. Another more flattering portrait in the great chamber 
is a small oval of William Cavendish, the first duke himself, which is mounted above the fireplace and set into one of a series of oak panels decorated with stunning limewood carvings. The carvings are incredibly realistic portrayals of birds, fishes, fruit and flowers, and they are also the work of the Chatsworth master carver Samuel Watson, whose work in alabaster we saw in the chapel. These carvings are so realistic that they're really a testament to Watson's artistry and skill, and we'll find more of his work in the next room we enter, which is the state drawing room, and which also features beautifully carved wooden friezes, and another grandiose ceiling painting, this time by Laguerre. Rather interestingly, during the Second World War, this luxurious and exquisitely decorated room was put to a more utilitarian purpose because it was used as a schoolgirl's dormitory when the students from Penrose College in Wales were evacuated to Chatsworth. I wonder what it must have been like for a Welsh schoolgirl to find herself living here and settling down to sleep in this rather magnificent room underneath Laguerre's ceiling painting of cavorting gods and goddesses. The schoolgirls would also have been surrounded in their new dormitory by some rather sumptuous wall hangings because the state drawing room is the home of a series of enormous tapestries that date from the 1630s and were created at the Mortlake Works. This was a tapestry studio that was set up in 1619 by Sir Francis Crane under the patronage of King James I and James encouraged the founding of the studio because, at the time, England didn't really have a tradition of tapestry weaving. The finest tapestries at that time were either produced in Brussels or Paris, and James wanted to ensure that England could also produce work that would rival the weaving made in these two famous cities. So he commissioned Sir Francis Crane to found the studio in the tiny Surrey village of Mordlake, and Crane recruited several Flemish artisans who came over to make the first Mortlake tapestries and who also passed on the skills of their craft to apprentice orphans who came there to learn from the city of London. The Chatsworth tapestries were purchased by the third Earl of Devonshire, and within the last five years, several of them have undergone conservation to clean and preserve them, and this means that they now glow with all of their original beautiful intensity and colour. Let's walk on now through a door to the left of the fireplace and enter the state music room. This is an incredibly sumptuous room. It glows with gold because it's lined with embossed and gilded leather wall hangings that create an immediate atmosphere of richness and warmth. It also features an array of gilded tables and chairs and several pieces of bull furniture, which is to say furniture that's been decorated with ornamental inlays of turtle shell, brass, bronze and other gleaming metals. This technique was pioneered by André Charles Boulle, who was a cabinet maker to Louis XIV in the 17th century. And by the 19th century, this style of furniture was enjoying something of a revival. So the sixth duke, who was the inveterate collector, bought several pieces of Boulle furniture and added them to his collection at Chatsworth. The Sixth Duke is also responsible for perhaps one of the most charming decorative features of Chatsworth that is visible from the state music room, hanging on the back of one of the interconnecting doors. It's an incredibly realistic looking painting of a violin that appears to be hanging against a panelled door and which was painted by the Dutch artist Jan van der Vaart. 
He painted it in the 17th century and it hung in Devonshire House in London for the best part of 200 years. However, in the 19th century, the sixth duke decided to remove the painting and bring it to Chatsworth. And he had the rather brilliant idea of actually setting the painting into a real panelled door, which creates a seamless optical illusion and makes it appear as though there's actually a real violin hanging there. Many visitors to Chatsworth assume that the violin is real when they first enter the room. And they're frequently amazed when they look closer and discover that the instrument is no more than a painted trompe l'oeil. It's an enchanting visual trick. And Vart's violin is one of the most famous and popular artworks at Chatsworth. The next room we'll enter is the state bedroom. And this is another lavishly decorated chamber which contains a magnificent four-poster bed covered with scarlet damask hangings. The bed was made for a king, George II, and it was originally installed in his bedroom at Kensington Palace. However, on the morning of the 25th of October, 1760, the king rose from his slumbers and was immediately seized with a heart attack. He died instantly, and subsequently the bed was acquired by the fourth Duke of Devonshire, who apparently had no qualms about owning the deathbed of a former king, and brought it here to Chatsworth. The rest of the bedchamber is equally grand. There are more gilded leather wall hangings, more tapestries, and yet another exuberantly painted ceiling. And on the wall to the left of the bed, there's also a low table, covered with a toilette cloth, which is set out with an elaborately decorated silver dressing service. This service contains 23 pieces, and it was made in Paris around the time of the 1670s for the English Queen Mary II. She would have used it for dressing in the morning. And the set includes a rectangular mirror, a ewer and a large silver platter, a pair of candlesticks, and also several lidded caskets in which the Queen would have stored all her jewels and beauty accessories. There aren't many silver dressing services dating from this era. It's one of the oldest ones known to exist. And if you're interested in the history of the toilette ritual, then you might enjoy listening to a previous talk I've made on the history of the dressing table. I'll put a link to it in the description below the video. The state bedroom and the interconnecting closet next door to it also contain a beautiful collection of blue and white Chinese porcelain as well as some Flemish Delftware. Delft pottery is a type of tin-glazed earthenware that originated in the Netherlands in the 17th century as a slightly cheaper European alternative to the very expensive Chinese porcelain that was being imported at the time. There's a selection of elegant vases and jars on display and in particular, there's a trio of rather eccentric-looking Delftware pieces that are sort of pyramid-shaped and topped with a selection of spouts. These rather odd-looking vases were designed in the 17th century during the era of tulip mania, which was a craze for tulip flowers that swept through Holland and the Low Countries and uh, made the price of tulips incredibly high. So these intriguing looking pieces were designed specifically for displaying individual cut tulips. Each one would have been placed within a spout to show it off to best advantage. And if you visit Chatsworth in the springtime, when tulips are in season, you might be lucky enough to actually see the vases being used for their original purpose, and they make an absolutely gorgeous display when they're filled with 
colourful tulip blooms. From the state closet, we'll walk into another small interconnecting room, which was originally a china closet, but which was refurbished in 2012 to become the old master drawings cabinet. In here, we'll find artworks collected by several of the different dukes, and there's a treasure trove of old masters on display, including works by Leonardo da Vinci, Rubens, Raphael, and Rembrandt. Most of the works are rotated around each year in order to preserve them, and also in order to provide returning visitors with something different to look at every time they come to Chatsworth. However, one more permanent exhibit in the room is a 17th century Florentine collector's cabinet, which is made up of dozens of little drawers, and which is exquisitely decorated with Pietra Dura designs. Pietra Dura is an Italian technique, and it's created using inlays of semi-precious stones that are cut and polished and arranged into beautiful patterns or pictures. In the centre of this cabinet, there's a lovely little scene of a pavilion set into a landscape, and it's been made up with a number of different stones, including brilliant green jade, beautiful blue lapis lazuli, and various jaspers and agates in a variety of different colours. The old master cabinet is the last room we'll visit in the first duke's suite of state apartments. And as we've taken our time wandering through all these magnificent rooms, I think now would be a good opportunity to pause and take a little break. So let's leave off our tour for the moment and resume it again next time in part two when we'll continue our exploration of Chatsworth House. Next time, we'll explore the sketch galleries, where we'll discover the life of the intriguing 18th century writer and socialite, Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, and we'll also investigate many other fabulous rooms, including the exquisite Mary Queen of Scots chambers and the wonderful library, which is my favourite room in the house. So until then, I hope you've enjoyed part one of this tour of Chatsworth, and I look forward to guiding you around the rest of the house next time. Thank you so much for your company. Goodbye.